Hey there, Python trainer Ruben Lerner here. Generator functions are one of Python's great inventions. I mean, it was in other languages too, and other languages have implemented them also. But the idea that I can write something that looks like a function, but provides me with an iterator, that is to say an object that knows how to behave inside of a for loop, wow, it's just really powerful. In this video, I don't want to talk about all the depth of what you can do with a generator function and how you, know, how, how you would want to integrate that into your work. Rather, I want to look at how it's implemented in the most sort of innermost way. So let me, let me show you what I mean. So I'm going to say here, def my gen. I'm going to say this, yield one, yield two, yield three. Now, if you have any experience whatsoever with generator functions, you know that when I run my gen, I'm not going to see one, two, or three. Rather, I'm going to get a generator object back. That's because Python notices that we've used yield, the special keyword yield, and we haven't used return. And thus, when it runs the function, when we run the function, it doesn't actually run the function body. Rather, it creates this generator object. So if I say g equals my gen, and now I can say next of g, and we don't normally use next explicitly in our code, but that's what happens inside of a for loop. So if I say next, it runs up to and including the next yield and then stops, sort of goes to sleep, and next of g, and next of g. And now when I do next of g, it's gonna give me a stop iteration. Okay, so that's like the background. But if I now say once again, g equals my gen, I'm running it again. So I get this generator object. Great, and I say next of g. And my question is, how does it know where it stopped? How does Python keep track of this, right? After all, I ran the generator before, and now it's like halfway between. It's like at the end of the line here, after yield one, but before yield two. So how does it know? Well, like most things in Python, this sort of information is kept in attributes. You can think of the attributes of an object as its own little private dictionary, a dictionary that we access not using a regular dictionary syntax, but rather using dot syntax. Every single object in Python has lots and lots of attributes, and methods are also attributes, but we're not talking about methods here. And I can get a list of the attributes on an object with dir. So if I say dir of g, show me the attributes on g. Now we're going to see all sorts of things here that are dunders, meaning they have a double underscore before and after the name. But if we go down far enough, we're going to see that there are a bunch of attributes here that are not actually dunders. And these are specific to our generator object. And you can see a few different things here. One of them is GI code. What is GI code? Well, if I look at g.gi code, what do we get here? We get a code object. Well, what's a code object? If I say dir on g, g i code, look what I get back. I get back a whole bunch of attributes that begin with co. Now, you might be familiar with what these are. If not, you can take a look at my function dissection lab talk that I gave at uh, PyCon in 2020. But basically, each of these is an attribute describing the code object, sort of like the brains of a function. So when you define a function, the function is compiled, and that compiled object is a code object. So this actually contains all the information about the function. So if I say here, for example, g.gi code, and then I say co, um, well, let's say co uh, code. That is the bytecode. This is the bytecode that was generated when Python compiled this code. And if I say import dis, I say dis.dis of g.gi code, co code. And look at what we have here. Load a constant one and yield the value, pop the top. Load constant two, yield the value, pop top. Load constant three, yield the value, pop top. Load constant zero and return the value. So actually, this is how our, this is how Python sees our generator object. So this is the function as it was compiled and it's located there. So we can get that from within the generator object. The thing is, you have to remember that when we define a function, we're creating a function object. But when we run a function, we're actually creating a new object, a new separate different object, a frame object, a stack frame. And that describes the current running of the function. And it's in that frame object that we have, for example, local variables. And we'll see that in a little bit. Well, where's that located? If I say g of gi frame, look at that. That's our frame object. And if I say here dir of g gi frame, we're going to see a whole bunch of attributes starting with f. Well, among other things, we have g, gi frame of g, or I'm sorry, f code. That's the code object, once again, that it's like pointing to the same thing as we were just looking at. But it gets better than that. What if I say here, f 
line no. Now, what that line number means is, let's go back to where we defined our function here, all the way back up at the top, right? Look at this. I'm just gonna copy this down here so we'll have it available. Put it in comments so we don't mess anything up. So we're currently at line number two, okay? And what if I say now, next of G? And now I say G, G I frame, F line, F line, no. Look at that, we've advanced it. The way that Python keeps track of where we are between calls to next is with that F line, no um, attribute. And so this is how a generator function can go to sleep and how when Python wakes it up, it knows where to continue from. Let's try a more interesting uh, and sort of traditional thing to show you with generator functions. I can say if fib, def fib, the Fibonacci sequence. I'm gonna say here first equals zero and second equals one. And I can say while true, and I'll say here yield first, and then I'll say first second equals second and first plus second. Now, this is not something you want to run in a for loop, not something you want to run in like list or something. So I say g, g equals fib. So now, of course, g, g i frame, f line, no. And we're going to see that it's currently at line one. It's right there. And if I say next of g, we're going to get the first number of the Fibonacci sequence. That's zero. And now if I once again say, hey, tell me what line number you're on. Well, now it's line five. Look at that. It's right after that yield. And this demonstrates then what I said before, which is when in, in each iteration, a generator will run up to and including the next yield, and then it goes to sleep and then it stops. So if I now say next to G again, and then I say, tell me line number, it's gonna be five again. Why? Because it got back there again and again and again. But we can look at additional things. Remember that one of the cool things about a generator function is that we're writing it as a function and thus it has local variables. And those local variables, they keep their state across calls. So if I now say G, G I frame, and the frame has F locals, look at this. These are our local variables, first and second. And so we can peek into the generator function that is currently running and see what locals it's keeping. And we see first and second, that's exactly what we're going to want. And that's exactly what we would have expected. So these attributes allow Python to tell a generator to go to sleep. And when it wakes up, where it should come from. This also explains why if I do like G2 equals uh, fib it's gonna have its own separate state because it might have the same function, it might have the same code object, but the generator is gonna have a separate frame with its own uh, local state. G2, GI frame, F locals, that's gonna be still at the beginning, right? Actually it has nothing, it has nothing defined. And if I now say next of G2, now I can say G2, GI frame, F locals, and sure enough, now it has advanced once. So I think this is kind of cool. And to see that, as I always like to say, Python uses Python to implement Python. What do we see here in our frame object? We see integers, we see dictionaries, we see, we see strings. In the case of the bytecodes, we even see a byte string, but it's all using the built-in Python basic data structures that we know and love. All right, if you want Python tips sent to you every week via email, subscribe to my Better Developers mailing list, Send me questions. I'd love to hear them. I'd love to hear from you on Twitter and via email. And I'll be back soon with another video.